Welcome to Data Structures with Professor Califf. Today I'd like to talk to you about how we represent graphs inside a computer. So the first thing you may be asking is what kind of graphs are we talking about? Because there are different kinds of things that we call graphs. We're actually not talking about things like bar graphs or line graphs. Instead, we're talking about the kind of graph that looks like this. The kind of graphs we tend to talk about a lot in computer science and in math in areas like discrete math or graph theory. A graph is made up of two kinds of elements. The first one is the vertices, singular vertex, sometimes called nodes. In fact, frequently called nodes. I will certainly do that. Each node might have some data associated with it. It will always have some sort of a label, some sort of name. Sometimes those will be just A, B, C, D, E, or vertex 1, vertex 2, vertex 3, that kind of thing. But sometimes they actually have meaning, as here where each one represents an airport. In addition to the vertices, we have edges that connect them. Edges can have direction. So in this graph, I can get from A to C, but not from C to A. I can get from E to D, but not directly from D to E though I could get there by going from D to B to A to E. Edges can also have weights, which can represent a lot of different things. They might represent distance. They could represent some sort of cost. They could represent time. They could represent uh, capacity. How much bandwidth do I have here? Or how much water can flow through this pipe in a certain amount of time? They can also have both direction and weight. Graphs get used for lots of different things. We use them for finding paths, like what's the shortest path or the quickest path from Dallas to Chicago. They can represent anything that's a kind of network. So data networks like Wi-Fi and internet, neural networks, social networks, like who are you connected with, the seven degrees of Kevin Bacon, those kinds of things. Knowledge representation for artificial intelligence can be done using graphs. Project plans, so if you've ever heard of something like a PERT chart, that's a kind of graph. Automata, if you've ever heard of a finite state machine, that's a kind of graph. And there are many, many more. So let's think about what it's going to take for us to actually represent this graph in the computer. We need to be able to start working from any vertex. I don't want to have to start my path from Chicago to Dallas at New York because the only place I can start in my graph is New York, right? Therefore, I don't have a single starting place like the root of a tree. Each vertex also needs to be able to have up to V out edges. It might have no edges out of it. It might have many, many edges out. And we need to be able to handle that no matter what the situation is. V, by the way, is the number of vertices in the graph. We use V for that instead of N because we are interested in the number of vertices. We're also interested in the number of edges in a graph, which we label as E. So we need letters that distinguish between the number of vertices and the number of edges. So V and E are the standard letters used. We think about how to meet those requirements we will quickly recognize that linked structures, like we use in many cases for trees, are not really efficient choices. We're going to need an array that allows us to access any vertex, whichever one we want to get to right now. And then, of course, we need to know what edges go out of any given vertex. So there are two main options for doing this. One of them is called the adjacency matrix. Adjacency here is referring to the relationship between two vertices, that if two vertices are adjacent to each other, that means that there is an edge from the one vertex to the other vertex. The adjacency matrix is a two-dimensional array, a V by V array. It works well for dense graphs, graphs that have many of the possible edges. An adjacency list is an array of V linked lists. So instead of a two dimensional array, we're going to have V linked lists. And this will work well for our sparse graphs. Before we get into the specifics of each of these, 
we do need to think about this whole question. How are we going to get from a vertex to an index? We can see we have arrays here where we have one spot per vertex, but my vertices are names, strings. So how do I turn that into an index? And then when I'm ready to output information about a vertex, how do I turn the index back into the vertex name? So the answer for this is that we're going to create an array or vector or array list of vertex names. For example, for the A, B, C, D, E graph, we might have an array that looks like this. So A is at index zero, B is at index one, and so on. For the airport code graph, we might have this array. Chicago O'Hare is at zero, LaGuardia is at one, LAX and DFW are at three and four. So let's think about how we actually would handle the indices. To turn the index into a name, once we have the index, we're just going to access that item in the array. So that will be very quick and easy. To turn a name into an index, we're going to simply search the array for that name, whatever index that name is found in, that's the index for that vertex. We could use a search tree or a hash table to more efficiently map the name to the index, but that's really only important for very large graphs. Our linear search is probably gonna be good enough for us for many situations. So let's look briefly at what the adjacency matrix for our undirected weighted graph would look like. The first thing we wanna understand is that the rows represent the vertex that the edge is coming out of, and the columns represent the vertex that the edge is going to. Notice that we have zeros along the primary diagonal because we don't have edges from A to A or from B to B or from C to C or from D to D or E to E. Now let's look at what we do have. So we have an edge from A to B. So that means we're going to have an edge here from zero, which is the index for A, to one, which is the index for B. And that is going to have the value three because three represents the weight of that. If we don't have weights, we typically just use one. Now in this case, our edges are undirected. So if we have an edge from A to B, we also have an edge from B to A. And we'll see that we find that in the matrix as well. If we go through here, there's an edge from A to C. So that's two, weight two from zero to column two, which is C's index. And we also have an edge from C to A. We have edge from A to D for five. And so we'll find that five here from zero to three and from three to zero, the edge from A to E for seven, we find in column four, row zero, and, col and row four, column zero. And we see the seven there. So we simply are taking these edges and recording them as, okay, if I have an edge from this vertex to another vertex, then that means in the row for the from vertex, and the column for the two vertex, I will find that value of what that weight is, or one if we're not, if we don't have weights. And of course, so we see that we have a edge from B to D. So B is index one, D is index three for us. So we're gonna see an edge in row one and column three of weight four, which matches what we have here. So fairly straightforward, fairly easy to interpret. That's the adjacency matrix. Now let's look at what happens with the adjacency list. So here we have only one array. This is an array of linked lists. Again, each vertex has its index. And then we have information about the edges out of that vertex again. This time they're in the form of linked list nodes and each node has the two index. So this first node here out of A 
index zero has index one, so that's B, and a weight of three, which is the weight on that edge. Here we have an edge from A, so that the from is determined by what array item you're in. There's no information about the from in the linked list node. That's simply telling you the two part and the weight of the edge. So from zero to two, A to C, for cost two, sorry, the edge to D has cost five, the edge to E has cost seven, and so there we see all of the edges out of A to somewhere else. And as with the adjacency matrix, if we have the edge going the other way, because this is an undirected graph, then we'll also see it there. So in index one, we're going to find a node that represents the edge to A, zero, four, three, as well as the edge to D, four, four. So notice that our representations, both the adjacency matrix and the adjacency list, are always representations of directed graphs, even when the graphs themselves are undirected. We simply represent both directions independently. And that tells us something about how we actually look at graphs. Um, I hope to eventually do a more extended video on each of the adjacency matrix and the adjacency list representations. This is just to give you some sense of how all of that works. Thank you for watching. Hope to see you next time.